If you've heard of topology, then you'd likely have heard the statement that to a topologist, a coffee mug and a donut are the same thing. What this is saying is that each of the coffee mug and the donut can be considered like clay, molded about a ring of some kind. Uh, the hole in the handle and the hole in the donut are indistinguishable to a topologist. Probably what you hear a lot less is that the topology most mathematicians are first introduced to is very different. And that is the metric space topology. There we have a thing we call a metric, which takes two points in a set and assigns a positive value, like a ruler. We call the metric applied to two points the distance between them, and a metric is also symmetric, so you can't get two different values if you turn the ruler around. And it satisfies the triangle inequality, where if you measure the lengths of two sides of a triangle and sum the measurements, they're gonna be larger than the length of the third. These are abstract triangles in our arbitrary set X, by the way. There is no reason to be stuck in RN for this discussion. In fact, Frechet sure, at the turn of the 20th century did a good deal of work generalizing topology away from RN and extended the idea to functions and sequences. I'll tell you about that in an upcoming video. Today, I want to tell you about open sets, closed sets, and limit points. I also want to show you an oversight from an analysis textbook, Baby Rudin, that turns a proof listed in only three lines into a solid page of proof. Topology is all about its open sets. Later, we will see that we can define a continuous function purely in terms of how it behaves around open sets and not even bother with epsilons and deltas, which is the lifeblood of analysis. Let's start with a neighborhood. Since we have a metric, we can select a point in set X, say P, fix some R greater than zero, and then define a set of all points in X closer to P than R. So a neighborhood about P is a collection of all points, say, close to P. An open set E is a set where if we take any P in E, then there's gonna be an R greater than zero such that the neighborhood of radius R about P is contained completely within E. We say that P is an interior point. With this definition, it immediately follows that the arbitrary union of open sets is open, since if a neighborhood is contained in one of its member sets, then it'll be contained inside the stack of all of them. Conversely, we can't always shave down neighborhoods infinitely. But if a point is in the intersection of a finite number of open sets, then we can just take the smallest neighborhood that fits inside of all of them. That means that the finite intersection of open sets is open. Now let's talk about a complementary concept, and that is of closed sets. Closed sets are those sets that contain all of their limit points. But what is a limit point exactly? I'm not talking about the limit of a sequence. That's actually a different concept. For instance, a constant sequence has a limit at that constant. However, finite sets don't have limit points. And this is how they're defined in topology. A point P in X is a limit point of a set E if every neighborhood about P has a point in E that isn't P. If E was finite, then for any point P in X, we can find a smallest distance between P and all of those points in E. And we can select the radius smaller than any of those to make a neighborhood that's disjoint from E. So if a set has a limit point, it can't be a finite set. Something that is neat from this definition is that the complement of a closed set is open. That's because if a point P is in the complement of the closed set, then it isn't a limit point of that set since closed sets have all their limit points. And so there has to be some neighborhood about that point that is disjoint from the closed set. That means that the neighborhood is contained completely in its complement. So the complement is open. Yeah, it's pretty neat, huh? You can actually show that the complement of an open set is closed. So this is an if and only if statement. What's really neat is that this means that where we have arbitrary unions of open sets being open, we now have arbitrary intersections of closed sets being closed. Also, only finite unions of closed sets are guaranteed to be closed. And this gets us to the point where we can say that metric spaces together with a collection of open sets forms a topology. In topology, we start with a set X and a collection of subsets we declare as open. The requirement we have on those sets is that we want arbitrary unions to be open and finite intersections to be open as well. Then closed sets are defined as our complements. I think we also need to have the entire set X and the empty set to be included in the collection of open sets too. This distinguishes Frechet sure and Hausdorff's perspectives on topology from the early 20th century. So where was the error that happened in Baby Rudin? 
Well, for a given set E, we can take its collection of limit points, and we'll call that E prime, and make the closure of E, which is E union E prime, uh, we call that E bar. The first thing you want to do about anything you call closure is that you want to show that it's actually closed. The idea is that we have all the limit points in hand. So if we take a point in the complement of E bar, then we should, in principle, have a point that isn't a limit point of E bar. Uh, which means, just like before, we can find a neighborhood disjoint from E bar that is inside of the uh, complement. This might have been E, and then adding in this like layer of extra points is E prime, and we're saying that P out here is there. So then that means that there should be some small enough neighborhood that's going to be disjoint from E because P can't be a limit point. Uh, the neighborhood of R about P intersection with E is empty. And so then this is more or less where Rudin stops and he says, ta-da, the complement is open because we just fit an open neighborhood in there. But what we said was that it was not a limit point of E. We did not say it was not a limit point of E prime. Uh, we need to add an extra lemma. If P isn't a limit point of E, then it's not a limit point of E prime. Right? So that's, that's the issue. Now I should say that Rudin isn't innocent of this fact. And this precise statement is an exercise at the end of the chapter. So before we jump into it, take a moment and give it a thought. And please come back afterwards. YouTube is big on watch time. Uh, so here, I'll put on some music. Okay, so we'll go about this quickly. We're going to show that if P is a limit point of E prime, then it is a limit point of E. And we're going to use the idea that every element of E prime is a limit point of E. So let's start with a neighborhood with radius R of this limit point E prime. Then we know that there is an element of E prime, Q, inside that neighborhood, and Q isn't P. So this is just definition of limit points. I'm saying that if we if P is a limit point of E prime, and we take an R greater than zero, then there is going to be a Q in E prime such that this Q is going to be inside that neighborhood. All right, so now what we have is we have this P, we made a neighborhood around it, and now we just got this Q here. Now, we would like to get an element of E and not just an element of E prime inside of P. So what we're going to do is we're going to make another neighborhood here, and we're going to slap a point in here, and then by the triangle inequality, it's going to still be inside of P. This is actually a little trick that Rudin used earlier in the book, because we know dPq is less than R, so in order to get to R, we basically just need to add some positive quantity H. That H is R minus dPq. Then what we do is we just go ahead and consider uh, an S in E uh, such that S is inside of the neighborhood of radius H about Q. And we know we can do this because Q is an element of E prime, so it's a limit point of E, so there, any neighborhood is going to have some element of E in it. And so, and then we're going to say that S is not equal to uh, Q here. And we'll also assume that uh, S is not equal to P, because we know there has to be at least an infinite number of points here. So now what we do is we try to show that S is actually inside of this neighborhood of radius R. And the way we do that is just by using triangle inequality. So we just want to show that this distance between P and S is less than R. We're saying that the distance between uh, P and S is less than the sum of the distance between P and Q and the distance between Q and S. That, that's what we're doing right now. And we know that distance between Q and S itself is strictly less than H because S comes from its neighborhood. So that means that we have this. This is less than or equal to, or less than, strictly less than, dpq uh, plus h, but this is exactly equal to r. And so that means that s is inside of the neighborhood of radius r about p. So that basically takes care of lemma, because for any limit point of e prime, we can take a neighborhood of that point, and we can find an element of e in there, which means that it is also a limit point for e. Okay. So we have the closure is closed, and that's nice. Now, closed sets and open sets are complements of each other, but that doesn't mean that an open set can't also be a closed set. For instance, the set of all points in a metric space is open and closed, and that means that a collection of no points is open and closed too. Uh, we call them cloaked. So an open set can still have its limit points, and a closed set can still have interior points, but they're also allowed not to. 
This has been fun. I like catching out little errors in these iconic textbooks. If you are struggling through analysis, I am currently doing a series of videos on this topic, and feel free to subscribe and, and join me on this journey. I just did a video last week about exponentials, and you can find that here. In any case, thank you for sitting through this with me, and I hope you have a great day.